Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is artist Lee Weeks. Lee, welcome back to Comic Culture. Thank you very much. We spoke uh, for about a half an hour before and I feel like we barely scratched the surface and I, I wanted to ask you a, a question because um, one of the things I notice about your artwork is that people are in places that look real. They look like uh, very detailed homes, well thought out uh, locations. It could be uh, an office. It could be um, in that recent Batman run, a jury room that has donuts and a coffee machine. Um, so I'm wondering, when you're designing a, a space for your characters to inhabit, what's going through your head and, and are you using references? Oh gosh, I hope I can pull this off. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I, I feel it's a weakness of mine, frankly, and uh, I, I work very hard to just, there are so many people doing incredibly detailed backgrounds and stuff today with the digital helps and stuff like that, that um, I can feel, it can feel intimidating sometimes, so, but the one thing I want to try to do is not overdo just create a, a, a visual verisimilitude, so to speak. You know, just create the essence, the, the, the feeling that you're someplace, but not necessarily have to put, uh, I'm always trying to figure out how to, do, how to put less in. <laughs> less is more. There's one scene, uh, again, going back to that uh, Batman annual where, where Catwoman and Batman are looking at a single pearl. Uh, and she's uh, standing, they're standing on a, an oriental rug. There's a frame behind them. And you put in just enough detail to make it look like this is a three-dimensional object, and yet it's just a few lines on, uh, you know, straight lines on this this frame that indicate that. So, at what point did you start to realize that less is more, and you can put in uh, fewer lines and still have the audience see it as three-dimensional and real? Very honestly, this is something that my classmates and I, a couple of friends, we talked about from the beginning. It's just so hard to get there. You know, you just look with, as you, the more you learn, and you, it's like, as, as kids uh, reading comics, when, when I say kids, it doesn't matter what age, but without the knowledge of what goes into it, you might look at an Alex Toth or a Joe Kubrick and not realize just how much knowledge there is there because you don't see it in ink. Whereas you see someone, and I won't pick on anybody, that puts in a lot of detail that may or may not be in the right places but they're putting in lots of stuff, and that seems more impressive as a young artist. But then when you start to learn and study and bang away at this a little bit, you realize, hey, this guy, you know, there's certain artists where every time you look at them, the more, when, when I've learned new stuff, I look at them and go, oh, wow, that person already knew that. I didn't have the eyes to see what they do uh, already, but now that I have the eyes to see it, I can see. So you just start, there just kind of fall in love with the magic trick of putting something there without really putting it there. You, you know what I mean? And and, and that becomes, uh, I, I don't, I'm not even sure I'm answering your question anymore. I'm kind of going off on it. But, but uh, one of the exciting things about drawing to me is is that aspect. Is It's not just less is more. It's that if you put the few things you put in, if they're put in the right place, the viewer has to do the rest of it. <laughs> has to, they're not to break out tools and go to work, but you see it. You, you enter into the drawing, kind of finish the drawing up or finish the scene in a storytelling moment where there's just a little you know, implication of something that's happened, but it hasn't really come out of the sound. And as a reader, you go, oh, that means such and such. That, that to me is really exciting. So. So this process of trying to do it with less. In the early days, there was more of a, a war at it because you, you, you want to draw everything at the same time, but you know that there's this, there's this other way of, of doing things with less. So there's always that, that battle back and forth of, of wanting to show off or, or whatever versus doing something with less. Speaking of less, it's, it seems that, uh, we, we talked about this earlier, that modern coloring is, is revolutionizing uh, comics, but it seems like a lot of the, the color work on uh, some of your figures um, is intuitive and, and really shows off maybe uh, a grayscale or, or some shadowing to give a three-dimensionality to 
a face or to a figure. And is that something that you are doing or you're suggesting to the colorist and, and letting her do? A few years ago, I'm trying to think of when I started doing it, I started scanning my work and, and it's true that the more you do, the less you do. <laughs> the less uh, rendering in the forms, the more open the forms are, the more there's a suggestion of form. Uh, the more you can run into problems with coloring with a, a less experienced colorist. Because the problem is they see the implied form and they want to render it. And once you've rendered it, you've killed the magic trick because you've just taken away something that the reader would be doing anyway. With nice flat color would, would really work beautifully. Uh, but some modeling, the other thing is black line, the, the, the way line art, establishes form and shadow is different than the way color does. So if you do too much of it with both, they, the, there are two different languages that clash, that it doesn't look right, at least to my eyes. So a lot of the coloring in comics, I'm, I'm not a big fan of. Um, having said that, I still believe it is the golden age of comic book color. There's some really great ones. Um, so something I started to do to just help and, and help avoid that over-rendering that would dilute the, the illusion a little bit, was I, I started adding in a set of gray tones. And the first, when I first did it, I just, I think I just added one or two values, but just to block the big forms, to give them another plane. But it, what it would do, it, it, it would, it seemed to be a way, and, and it seems to have worked for the most part, especially with a couple of conversations to just prevent some of that over from happening because, okay, there are the forms, I'm just gonna stick to those. So yeah, I do it at great scale. You've been doing uh, your own inks uh, recently, and I'm wondering, you've, you've had the opportunity to work with some great inkers, and I'm, I'm just wondering, when you look at the work that you're inking versus what they're inking, what do you bring that they don't, and what do they bring that you don't? Oh gosh. It's funny, no matter how, I mean, I've worked with thinkers that are such better artists than me, and yet it's never, it's never going to be quite what the penciler sees. So there's always a little bit of a di disconnect, a little bit of a, um, you know, you're, there's a, there's a, uh, any kind of team situation like that. There are things you give up in order to, but to things you get are so great because you get, you know, I work with Al Williamson. He's, one of the all-time, all-time greats, and just such a gifted artist, Tom Palmer. You know, you think of him as an inker. He's, he's one of the best and most knowledgeable artists in the business. Um, but then there's that thing, that way that you, a person sees that you want to see it that way, even with its flaws. And so I, I ventured out into inking more of my own stuff. And I have to tell you, most of my pages feel like a train wreck. Uh, for the, at least the first half to two thirds of the way through, or, or a good portion of them. Maybe maybe it's not most, but it, it, I I feel very much like I'm, I'm uh, uh, working without a net. You know, I don't. It doesn't feel like I'm that I confidently know what I'm doing. So it's always funny to me when people say you hey, with such confidence. I'm like, well, there's another magic trick because it doesn't feel that way. But. Uh, Different people bring different things, you know. There, there's a Al, what he brought. I mean, it's just hard to say, really, because he brought so much. He was the first one I worked with that let me see that. I want to say this in a way that it's not. A, it doesn't feel like a left-handed comment because I mean this wholeheartedly as a total positive. But he would let his line wander a little bit. You know, he would just. I could tell that he wasn't moving right up on the instrument, trying to force it to do this perfect thick to thin feathered line, like maybe I grew up looking at a lot of the books that I look at, you know, and it's so much life in it, there's so much beauty in it, and it looked, you know, just alive. Um, Bill Sienkiewicz, when he inked me, it was just a shock. I mean, a wonderful shock because uh, I was known as one that was pretty persnickety over inking and stuff and liked my pencils faithfully inked. So I know people were worried that, you know, I wouldn't like it. And I just, I absolutely adored it. I loved it so much what he did. 
And it actually looked, I, I, what I couldn't understand was how he was able to put in his bills and cabbages, and yet it still looked more like I drew it than many other people in the past would think me, where they had tried to ink me very faithfully and the Lord. And it dawned on me, oh, that's because Bill understands what I'm doing more than I understand what I'm doing. And this is going back 20 years. Uh, he just, he, he knew what my lines meant better than I did. So he was able to ink them in a way that I wouldn't have been able to ink them and still maintain what it was that I was trying to do. He made room for both of us. That was pretty incredible. Now, you said something about uh, having life to the line, and I, I know I'm a, a hobby cartoonist, and if I'm doing some artwork, I find that if I uh, try and do pencils too tightly, when I go to ink, the, the, the magic is kind of gone. So I'm wondering, when you are at the drawing board and you start to ink, are you going on top of full pencils, or do you just have something kind of rough out there and you just you know, grab the pen or the brush and, and go and finish it that way? Uh, sometimes it's full pencils, but I try not to. Um, but there are certain things that I just, and again, it comes down to just how sure am I. The more sure I am, the more I can just jump into the, the, the uh, pen and ink. Um, and it, it really does depend on what it is. And, and uh, I think that's what you're saying is, is really the best way to go, is to, to maintain the life of the drawing. Because if, if the thing is too tight there in the pencils, you're not really drawing anymore. You're, it, it can become too careful, and, and some of the life can be sapped out of it. Um, I remember hearing a story about Milton Kniff, Terry the Pirate Sky, who he's one of the ones that for years I, I keep looking at his work and like, oh, he already knew this. He already, and it's, it, it, and it seemed like such a, you know, almost like a cartooning style, but just so brilliant. Um, but there's a hit, or maybe no, it was Noel Sickles, who was another one in the same, the same gene, uh, artistic genealogy as, as uh, Milton Kniff. But he had a strip that he was doing. I don't know if it was which one it was. But I, I remember hearing that he um, just spent 20 minutes or 30 minutes on each stage writing, penciling, and inking of the strip, or maybe it was an hour. But it, 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 so that would seem like three hours a day to do a strip, but his day would be 10 hours long or whatever it was. Because if he didn't, uh, if, if he didn't hit it just right, he would just start over. He just, he wanted it to be a single pass through where the life would remain in the inking and the drawing. So he, he would do it over several times just to make sure that it was, it, it, it maintained that life. Now, you, you mentioned, um that you will go back and look at uh, Milt Kniff's work. And, and this was something uh, a few weeks back, or maybe a month or so ago, you had posted uh, a Daredevil piece that you had done, um, and you, I had commented that you looked like you were trying to be reminiscent of that. And it's interesting to hear that you were studying uh, this type of uh, art just to, I guess, find new things that you could do. And I'm wondering how you are approaching your art when you start to look at your influences, whether it's you know, uh, someone like Milt, whether it's somebody like uh, John Buscema or uh, Joe Kub uh, Kubert. Uh, so when you're looking at their art and then start doing a project, do you find yourself saying, let me try something that they would do? Or is it just something that comes out because it's been that influence on you for years? Well, there, there isn't a lot of that that goes on the last several years. Um, I mean, I still look at stuff, obviously. But, but I, I, the, the most dramatic shift in that regard was the Milton Kniff stuff. I, I was aware of it. I had a passing appreciation for it, but I never really delved into it. I had been in the business for about five years, and I got a shot at doing Daredevil. It was the first big break I got. And I thought, my goodness, I, got, I, I was very unsatisfied with my work. Um, just didn't seem to have a, a direction to it. I had some ideas, but and I just knew I needed to do something different to step up my game. And I had some Terry the Pirate stuff. And so I just started looking and trying to understand what I could, which probably wasn't very much at the time. But just to pick up on a few things, the way he would frame heads, the way he would frame shots. And I, I started employing some of that in the spotting of blacks. 
and no one would look at my daredevil work and say, oh, look, he's, they would not confuse me, my style, for not looking at but he was very helpful, you know what I mean, because of the, what he was doing, the cross, the structural things that, you know, irrespective of, of, uh, of styles, it's going to, it's going to be helpful, and it was hugely helpful. He was a he was a big help to me, you know, when I when I started there. But in the early days, there was a lot more of that of looking at, and and I suppose um, if there's something I, that pops into my head and I'm stuck on something, I may look the way somebody else solved the problem just to help me I, unlock it a little bit. Um, and then there were certain guys that I now remember years back, you know, a stack of certain guys' books who were inspirational sitting next to the drawing table. As artists, we're like, okay, who, who's that? Who's sit, whose work is sitting next to the table? And uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez was like, a, you know, a couple of his books were so beat up because they were like textbooks for me for drawing. Um, he, he was just so excellent all the time. And Joe Kubert again for storytelling and, and layout. And, and the other thing that Joe, uh, looking at Joe's, did was in that same period where I was struggling with finding my look, I noticed that I put in lots and lots and lots of work, and yet my pages felt empty. And I was like, how can I put in so many lines? At least it just feel like it's not much there. The Joe's work, this is after I left the school, I was not heavily influenced by Joe prior or during my time at the school, but it was a couple of years after I left. And I was, I remember what I was working on, but I just started studying him a little bit to see how he was able to make something look so full with just these simple few lines. Again, back to the simplicity, but in a different, a different manner of speaking. And uh, so he was helpful in unlocking some of that for me, just to, because sometimes you, you I don't want to go too detailed, but that, that when you start drawing with little tiny line intervals, you just kind of set yourself up to have to fill the entire page that way. And if it doesn't get filled up that way, it looks empty. Whereas if the line interval is a little more spacious to begin with, then it can be full with very few lines. And that's one of the things I've noticed um, in, in some of your cityscapes. You could have uh, some big, bold shapes that will indicate, you know, some of the skyline, some of the buildings, maybe the rooftop that we're on uh, in the, uh, I guess, where the characters are will be uh, rendered. Uh, but where the eye isn't looking, maybe you're going to kind of lay back and instead of taking the ruler out and making sure that every brick and mortar line is, is perfectly straight and, and looks right, you might just quickly, what would appear to be a quick line here or there to suggest that. Is that something that you're consciously doing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can't do that much work. <laughs> I just can't. I don't know the digital tools to do to the guys that are doing it quickly that way. But, but before that, before that, that I can't do, it's, I also don't find it the most, uh, you know, it's not always the most effective way. Again, down to storytelling and focus and such. If you look at Rembrandt, I'm not trying to please don't compare it, I'm not, but if you look at Rembrandt's work, especially as he gets later years, he would have one area of tight focus, and then things would subordinate more and more around the outside or in his portraits and stuff. And I just think there are things um, like that that are helpful, that help keep the eye right where you want to keep it, rather than getting it pulled in a bunch of different directions. So one of the ways to do that is to simplify and apply more outside of the, the specific area of focus. But it, but it, some of it is that it's just very daunting to think about doing, you know, that, that much close-up detail work. And, and I want to tell stories. You know, so I don't want to be an architect. <laughs> but I certainly admire, really admire the guys that can do that and put that kind of consistent time into it. It's, it's very impressive. I wanted to ask a, a, a question about the writers that you've worked with. It seems you've got a good relationship with them. So I'm wondering, when you're collaborating with a, a writer on the project, um, how does that collaboration work? Are you on the phone kind of talking things over? Is it just 
reading the script and, and you know, they'll trust you to get it, or is it something else? Uh, it, it's minimal talking, minimal talking. Um, um, I would love to have a more, uh, have that experience of a more day-to-day -day collaborative you know, experience. And team is always, you know, I've played a lot of sports groups and stuff. It's, it's fun to be part of a team. And it's fun to bounce stuff back and forth. I mean, I, I, I want to write. You know, I, I enjoy the, the creative process. Um, a few times it's been just getting the script and going with it. Usually a little bit of communication. I love to drop lines back and forth or to send work in progress, shots, layouts to my writer. Done it more with Tom probably than it's been a long time since I've done it, you know, when I'm working with him, I, I'll send him stuff. And, and mostly just because I'm excited, you know, and, and, uh, really excited to be uh, working on the stuff. So that, that's, that's the extent of it. it just, there's an initial upfront conversation with Tom, maybe a couple, and then he does his thing, heads off to me. Um, one thing in particular, I just saw that he Instagrammed a, a shot from an early design shot from the Batman Elmer Fun book that we did a few years ago. And it was Bugs Bunny, the animal version. Although I have to correct him, he, he didn't quite have the story right in his Instagram description. But uh, when I got that, that script for the first time, there was a discussion. And what I remember is that it could be done either way. But the, Looney really two characters being animals or humans. And I initially, because I just, I just like, I don't know how to do these as, as human. And uh, so I did the, laid out the first eight pages with them as kind of bizarro animal version. So, you know, they, they're Looney two as the cartoon characters, but a little twisted. And after I sent him those first eight pages of layouts, he went back and said, this is great. But I was kind of hoping we could do, you know, we're human, but if you said I'm doing this, that's fine, da 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 I said, well, let me try it. And so as I started to think of what Bugs the Bunny would look like, or what Taz the Devil would be, or it became fun really, really quick, and I am so, so very glad that he uh, pulled the leash off me on that one, you know, because I, that was such a, a perfect choice, and it would have been a very different book. And it's amazing, too, because on the surface, Batman versus Elmer Fudd does not seem like um, a great idea. And yet, with the two of you working on it, it turns into it's a heartbreaking uh, noir story that, you know, you expect to see on the, the silver screen in the 1940s. That will forever be one of the greatest gifts ever in my career. I cannot believe. And that was it was going to be something totally different initially. Tom had a different idea. So he he reeled me in on that one, but before we got that far, he, he wanted to do a, uh, I, I think it's okay, he, he has said this, so it's okay to say this. He wanted to do Elmer as like a Jack the Ripper, like a, a, a slasher thing. And I I think I reacted the way you just did. I chuckled and I said, well, that sounds interesting, but that won't, I, I said, if you, if, I, I wouldn't be able to go that way with you. Just wouldn't be my sensibilities. He said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, if we get a film noir, or if we just was like a noir that was like a, and I had been watching like Asphalt Jungle and a few other uh, noir films that were, you know, they have an edge to it, but they're not, it's not in your face kind of stuff. So uh, about 10 days later, I got that script and, and about 10 days into laying it out, I started to tell friends who, uh, you know, when I tell them what I was working on, you could kind of feel the petting of the top of the head, like, I'll pour you. Well, that one will be over quickly. And I'd have to say, I know you're going to think I'm nuts, but I think I'm working on one of the best things I've ever had a chance to work on. This is going to be... And I would laugh, because i just like, maybe I'm nuts. Maybe I'm just so caught up in the delusion that I'm just, could, could, you know... But it, whatever it was, that enthusiasm really got poured into the work, because I had more fun doing that book than just about anything I've ever done. It was just such a joy and, uh, and uh, you know, a real gift. And Tom's been a real gift. 
to be too. So. Well, Lee, I, I want to say this has been a gift to me. I want to thank you so much for taking time out, not once but twice, to talk to me today. I'd like to thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.